Honestly, when I put up that poll of Mega Man X6 versus Sonic the Hedgehog as the next review, I wasn't sure what to expect for the winner, but the Blue Bomber ended up getting far more votes than the Blue Blur. I think I understand exactly why though. Y'all want to see me rage, don't you? Y'all want to hear me rip this game to threats, don't you? For those one or two viewers watching at the moment that are not in the loop, Mega Man X6 is infamous for being one of the worst entries in the entire Mega Man franchise. Despite Metacritic and game rankings not suggesting that it is a bad product with average scores of 65% and 69%, I've heard plenty horror stories of the game for many years from gamers. Some absolutely loathe it with all their might even. The day where I finally participate in this conversation is now upon us with this critical analysis. If you haven't done so already, I recommend watching my X4 and X5 videos first for a better overall context. Mega Man X1 to X3 are not necessary and their older videos in addition. But without further ado, it's time to crack that X6 beast wide open and get this party rolling. <laughs> Normally, I try my best to cover story-related aspects with proper thought, but many of you know, and those who do not explicitly know have probably noticed, that that stuff is not my strongest point or biggest interest. With this video absolutely pushing it in length, the plot talk had to go. I apologize if you were looking forward to this as well, and I can promise you I am not trying to hide anything here. I just decided to scrap what felt least important to me. The only thing I'll say on this front is that the English translation is horrifically shoddy. There is no one else's left to fight is the first of many poorly structured sentences and there are some embarrassing typos never kinked out. Over right, as in Phoenix right, stuck out to me the most because X5 got the spelling of it correct for crying out loud. If X6 were released in the 80s, this stuff could be overlooked, but by 2001, standards for English translations had been been set far higher than this. So, with that settled and cleared up, X6's gameplay starts with your typical intro stage that sets out to teach the character staple moves through level design. The shooting and wall jumping parts are well done as always, no complaints there, and since Zero died in X5, X can now use his Z Saber as well. It's necessary to get rid of obstructive containers that reflect all buster shots, and the rolling balls that do the same give the player an opportunity to get a feel for the handling of the Z Saber as X. Critique has often been aimed at how slowly X swings the weapon compared to Zero, making it unsatisfying to use, and while I can see where that's coming from, it was probably kind of necessary. To jump the gun for a bit, Zero can be unlocked as a playable character because he is actually alive. If X was equally as skilled with the Z Saber as Zero, there would be some significant balancing issues going on between the two. Besides, I think the large hitbox of the blade and its damage output give enough incentive to use it over the buster in certain situations. The only gripe I have that I can directly think of is that you cannot slash the thing as X without falling off of ropes. This feels like a handicap more than anything else, but that's about it. Now, to get back to the topic of the intro stage, I do think optimizations could have been made in some places. The ability to duck and the rope concept, both carried over from X5, are sort of hinted at with a specific specific enemy placement and this random zip line hanging about here, but these things can easily be ignored. The player will learn about set mechanics naturally as they go through the game, but if the intro stage flirts with including mini tutorials for them, it may as well have made mandatory obstacles around them. A crusher coming down with enemies crawling along the ground under it for the crouching, and a zip line across a bottomless pit for the rope would have ensured that the player knows how to use both. If really at a loss, the designers could have resorted to Alia explaining stuff to you. It wouldn't be harmful because her calls have been made optional to answer. Thank God. You either press select to hear what Alia has to tell you or nothing to completely ignore her. This applies for the entirety of the game and is often cited as one of the aspects X6 does better than X5. While I have to admit that it's a very, 
very welcome consideration, I cannot really praise it either. I mean, X5 should not have forced this bollocks in the first place. Still, this combined with a decent intro stage gives a jot of hope that maybe people exaggerate how bad X6 actually is. The music here is also fantastic. The song opens with a grand, apocalyptic sound, emphasizing the devastated state of the earth, and then rolls into a calm blend of deep bass, slow beats, and relaxing strings, suggesting that there is hope left. It's very beautiful and probably my favorite intro stage theme in the X series, alongside X's Sky Lagoon theme in X4. By the end of the intro stage awaits the first boss, and I want to give this one some credit. X1 to X4 all had these huge monstrosities as intro stage bosses that turned out to be absolute babies once you started fighting them. X6 lives up to the appearance of the boss by making it very resistant to direct physical assault and asking the player to attack the smaller device that's powering the guy instead. It's more believable, and not to forget, it puts the learned skills from the stage itself to a proper test. After a brief hissy fit with Hymax that neither you nor him can win, and finding out about Alia's secret desire for Mega D, the traditional 8 freely selectable stages with the boss at the end predictably kick in. And off the bat, I'm so relieved that there isn't some rubbish about enigmas and shuttles that have funky luck-based algorithms behind them. That idea only served to make X5 more of a confusing and sometimes unfair ordeal than it needed to be. Yeah, X6 could have implemented a similar system that was properly thought out to be actually interesting or worthwhile, but it could also easily have panned out just as terribly. I'm a-okay with it being scrapped altogether. You just pick your stage of choice and off you go. And that's exactly what we are going to do. The first stage of the bunch in the selection is the Amazon area. This level doesn't have any specific gimmicks of interest. It's traditional running and gunning with many splices of platforming, but the ink competent camera placement throughout needs addressing. You see, from X3 to X5, the designers have always struggled a bit with a field of view whenever downwards vertical progression was involved. Rather than going back to the drawing board on how to resolve the problem, however, the Amazon area in X6 just screams bugger it all and cranks it up to the worst degree yet. You know how in practically every good game, when you see a hole in the ground and the screen stops scrolling down, that you can assume it's a bottomless pit? Yeah, this level flips the bird to that. Players are required to leap of faith down to advance on multiple occasions when the screen stops scrolling vertically and are given a poor idea in general of what to expect. The worst example is the bed of instant KO spikes and the moving platform you have to land on in the cave. You basically must perform a blind jump and pray you nailed it. The engine has proven so often that the camera's panning can be regulated pretty freely so there is no no excuse for the screen to conveniently lock in place, just barely hiding crucial information. Adding insult to injury are the darn aggressive praying mantis enemies, sporting slicers that track you down after being thrown. These persistent assholes swiftly respawn after being dispatched, and when you're trying to be cautious because the camera isn't where you want it to be, having them lurking around makes navigation all the more grating. The kicker is, the Amazon area would have been fine if it weren't for this, and while the camera issues are the most blatant here, they are pretty prevalent throughout X6. Enemies from the top of the screen nuking you or straight up falling into spikes you have no time to react to. It's beautiful. In all seriousness, don't fucking play spikes in spots players could easily fall into without realizing it. Now, upon completion of your first stage, you'll undoubtedly have noticed a new component, which also happens to be covered on the mission report screen. Rescue Reploids. X5 had some of these in a small handful of levels, but I didn't bring mention to them because helping them got you nothing aside from a small bit of health and a useless extra life. It was a shallow, meaningless inclusion. For X6, it's a different story since every stage has 16 rescuable Reploids, of which 5 reward you with a part. Yes, the part system from X5 indeed returns and fundamentally it's very similar, but in execution, I find 
want it to be superior. The fact it's no longer such a confusing and cryptic feature to wrap your head around is a big plus, and the parts are a great incentive for the player to actually give a shit about saving Reploids in danger. With clever placements, extra exploration, and tougher mini challenges for more curious and skilled players can also be incorporated into the levels. X6 does actually take advantage of this to a solid degree by placing Reploids in treacherous spots or in secret areas, however, from this rises a big issue at the same time. Because only 5 Reploids of the 16 in a stage grant you anything for helping them out, that means the other 11 could very well be a waste of your time and effort. When they're straight on your path, whatever, stop crying, Metropo bitch, but when they're tough to find or get to, I have a right to become frustrated with the game. Plenty of the 16 Reploids can also be turned into Mavericks by surrounding Nightmare Viruses. Trust me, I'll get to these Jagwagons and therefore made permanently unrescuable. This, by the way, is set in stone to happen at least a handful of times to newcomers, seeing how the circumstances in which you have to save some of these people can be massively stacked against you. You are allowed to reset your save file as often as you'd like to make said Reploids rescuable again, but the fatal flaw above all is that you don't know who even grants you a part and who doesn't. Fuck, this Reploid became a maverick. Did he carry a part? Damn, I saved a bunch of Reploids in this stage and got jack squat for it? Unless you're using a guide, which should not be required, just saying, these are the type of scenarios you're going to run into. Why isn't it indicated who actually possesses a part and who doesn't? Or better yet, why wasn't the number of rescuable Reploids limited to 5 per stage with a part for each? Having 11 of these pointless dimwits packed in can only get you needlessly damaged or knocked into pits, or be seen as an attempt to troll players because they may reload their save files while it wasn't even necessary. It's a bunch of nonsense. Having discussed all of that, let's head to our second level in the selection, Inami Temple, and this is one of the better stages in the game if you ask me. It has an interesting gimmick where the player has to destroy all the small cores in a given selection to proceed to the next. To add a bit of pressure, there is continuous toxic rain pouring down that slowly drains your health and you can use these little blue platforms at the start of each section to regenerate all lost health as often as you want. This creates a fair, time-based challenge with the choice to play it safe and go back to regenerate health or be a little more daring and press on without going back. The concept is introduced in a confined location and then each section gradually becomes longer and more linear with more interfering foes, so the difficulty curve is solid as well. I also enjoyed the crossing water set piece with the rockets you have to carefully jump between and hang on to. It makes a great use of the wall jumping mechanic, and I consider the tune playing in the background one of the most memorable ones in the game. Perhaps that's just me, but hey, music is always so highly subjective, isn't it? Sadly, the stage isn't perfect as the last section starts one of X6's lame habits of cramming too much crap into a single space. You'll be trying to pay attention to these buff boys, reading their telegraphs and avoiding their attacks to outperform them, but then one, two or even more bats can fly into the seam at seemingly random intervals to inflict touch damage or drop a bomb on your coconut. The toxic rain is going on all the while and combined with camera shortcomings all Amazon area, this home stretch doesn't feel well thought out. Some of the cores are even tucked behind a rescuable Reploid, which isn't necessarily a bad hiding spot, but this equates to taking a hit from something that is impossible to anticipate on. Great! Assuming the order I am using in this script to talk about the 8 main levels, Inami Temple is also the first to expose us to the two most obnoxious enemies in the game. The Nightmare Viruses, I told you I'd get back to these jerks, can move and shoot in any direction, right through anything and everything. You, the player, cannot do either, so that's fair. This is especially a slap in the face when a Nightmare Virus is approaching a rescuable Reploid you aren't able to reach because some 
something is blocking you. It's a cruel joke. It doesn't help that these rule breakers are perhaps the most commonplace enemies in the game and have a tendency to come in groups on top of that, which is just wonderful. One stage especially suffers from that. Then there's Mondando, a large stationary purple robot that freaking 90% of the time is holding up its arm to block your attacks. The only opportunity to deal out blows is when the piss flap tries to hit you. Now, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but I just couldn't reliably trigger his AI to assault me in the first place. Maybe there is a good way to fight him efficiently, but for me, he's constantly been a pace breaker. I'd rather just jump over him whenever possible or otherwise accept the hit for the sake of carrying on. And the late game is littered with these twats on platforms that can barely house them too. Anyway, we're moving on to the level Laser Institute, which is conceptually sound and original, but ultimately came out meh. It starts out with a remarkable stretch of nothing and then has a short section with invisible platforms. Fortunately, it isn't cheap since enemies reveal where you can actually stand and then the main gimmick sets in, reflecting lasers via mirrors to open doors. You're occupied with that for about four rooms, which as far as I'm concerned is quite cool, and then it ends far earlier than you'd expect. The stage is incredibly short, which is probably its most major issue, and I get that room after room of mirror puzzles gets old and samey quickly. At the same time, while pay shooting and platforming with the mentioned invisible save grounds, alongside maybe some other ideas, would have likely filled the gaps just fine. As a matter of fact, the stage as a whole is quite large in size. If you open the bottom door at this planning point, a whole second portion of the stage is awaiting you with a final mirror puzzle, invisible platform supported by enemies, and a rope section. This path doesn't lead to the main boss of the stage, however, and is instead an alternate route of sorts. In truth, each of the eight main stages have a secondary path like this, which is usually entered via these blue crystal warp points. In here, you can often find stuff like heart tanks, armor upgrades, rescuable reploids for parts to find, that sort of business. I assume this whole thing was done in an attempt to enhance exploration in the levels, and I can command the efforts made, but the execution couldn't be worse. Once you enter a blue crystal to teleport to the alternate area, you cannot go back to the main path for whatever reason. This is just stupid, as these secondary routes do not lead to the main bosses of the stages, as I said, and thus you'll have to pay a minimum of two visits to most, if not all of the eight main stages, if you want to get all the collectibles and defeat the main boss. Why didn't they opt to split levels into two branching paths that merge together again at the end, Crash Bandicoot 2 style? Or at least allow you to travel back to the main path after entering the secondary one. To make it completely painless, why not add teleportation points throughout the levels to make this type of semi-linear design less of a time-consuming hassle? Shadow the Hedgehog allowed you to war between activated checkpoints, and it was a very helpful feature. Now, if the main bosses are not awaiting at the end of secondary paths, then what is? Initially, it's always this purple zero being, and after defeating it, you unlock the real Zero as a playable character. More on him in a bit. Once you've unlocked Zero, this high max dude is going to be your opponent in these rooms, and if you can win from him, you can move on straight to the gate stages without having to beat the remaining main eight levels. Once that's done, or if you naturally open the gate stages by normal conventions without beating high max, Dynamo from X5 will endlessly occupy these battle rooms at the end of the secondary pass. With all of that information laid out, let me explain what fucking blows the most about the alternate routes. Throughout the X series, when a stage its Maverick boss is beaten, you can exit the stage at any desired moment from the pause menu. The same applies to X6, unless you've entered a secondary area. Since Dynamo never dies and keeps returning and returning, in every stage, regardless of how many goddamn times he's been beaten, you are always forced to either win a battle from him or commit suicide until you've run out of lies, which allows you to exit the stage without losing any gathered items. Considering each rescuable reploid grants you a one-up on the fly when helped, you could have up to 10 extra lives to get rid of. Jesus, did they really not realize how massively inconvenient it is to get a one-up from each reploid? Game overs always return you to the last checkpoint like in X5, so the point is very much 
lost on me. The worst is when you're trying to collect items and upgrades before the gate stages are opened, meaning you will constantly be running into high max by the end of the secondary route. This bunghole takes long as all hell to beat, is pretty difficult as is, and requires some very particular steps to even be damaged. So if you enter his chamber with a checkpoint on it, getting a game over from him is probably the most enticing way to leave the stage for most people. To clarify, this process can take up to 10 minutes under bad circumstances. Up to 10 minutes just to leave the fucking stage and proceed to the next one. That is awful game design. Truly, it's one gigantic shit show. The potential for more fleshed out, exploration inclusive levels was there, and with some proper streamlining and the ability to leave levels at all times, that's the core issue, it could have been realized splendidly. Instead, all the alternate routes ended up achieving was making X6 more of a chore to play. To get to Zero as a playable character now, not too much has changed from X5 really, but enough to briefly dive into. He has some new animations, which is sweet, it wasn't necessary, but the team went ahead and did it anyway. His Z-Buster is way more powerful on a much more regular basis since it's more powerful and fires faster. In fact, it often wipes the floor with bosses the most efficiently, and the techniques aren't too shabby. But again, I am not the fella to dissect weapons and techniques in Mega Man titles, so I've learned to not even bother. The one major annoyance I do have to point out though is that Zero's downwards glide maneuver to the ground is implemented terribly. It's activated by pressing the attack button and up on the D-pad simultaneously in midair. How does up translate to a move that launches me downwards without any control until I hit the floor or in many other scenarios a bottomless pit. This has screwed me over far more frequently than it should have, especially above ropes, because up must be pressed to attach yourself. I don't recall having issues with regards to controls in any of the previous X installments, which makes this all the more of a bizarre thing to me. For some positive vibes again though, I think it'd be wise to move on to the North Pole area now, the fourth select stage of the 8, which is commonly agreed upon to be one of the most well-designed stages in X6. It's got a lot of timed elements to it, like hiding in evacuation spots to steer clear from ice rocks, crashing down the slippery slope you're traversing, precise platforming on small surfaces while avoiding attacks from wolves, and near the end you have to climb out of traps by jumping on ice cubes that start falling down. A pretty satisfying conclusion is reached with the last obstacle set, as you have to reach the safe spot in each horizontal chain of dropping ice cubes before they reach the ground. Rather than dickish enemy design and placement or poor camera positioning, this stage mostly relies on genuinely tricky and very shenanigans to create challenge. This section right here does feel sloppy with no way of avoiding damage from what I could tell, and there is one set of spikes you can fall into that cannot be predicted, but checkpoints here are so frequent that any trial and error elements that are present are hardly worth wasting our prepared butthurt cream over. Nevertheless, the difficulty doesn't entirely come from the most graceful place either in my opinion. The ice physics sometimes feel janky and unpredictable, and more importantly, the ability to wall jump is removed. Perhaps it's hard for X and Zero to get decent footing on surfaces covered in ice, but they could wall jump off of them just fine in X4, so that argument's out the window. The rules here come across as arbitrary by taking out one of the defining mechanics of the X series, and they aren't communicated very well to the player in addition. That's not to say the North Pole area makes for a bad level, I thought it was pretty fun and so did many others as I've stated, and at least it is consistent regarding its lack of wall jumping possibilities. In Laser Institute for example, you cannot wall jump to rescue this floating Reploid so he is likely to get killed by the nearby Nightmare Virus, and in the Amazon area, you're not allowed to wall jump to this portal that you could easily fall past because you wouldn't know it's located there. What the fuck is that all about? This segues us willy-nilly into X6's nightmare system and how that affects the gameplay. It can zap away much of the fun that can be had in some of the game's better stages without you realizing it's caused by outside factors. 
Here's the deal. After finishing or leaving a stage, a specific nightmare gimmick is inflicted upon certain other stages. For example, exiting Recycle Lab triggers gray metal blocks to appear in the Magma area, Weapon Center and Central Museum, and exiting the North Pole area ices the floors in Recycle Lab. Now, a good dose of these effects are either fairly harmless, like these weird colored crates I encountered, or not much more than an annoyance, like the metallic bees that surround you and block your shot until they finally decide they had enough and leave you the hell alone. Some others, unfortunately, are just... Ugh. Primarily, I'm looking at the lights out effect that can plague Inami Temple and the Amazon area, where a substantial portion of the screen is darkened or completely blacked out, with two streaks of light shifting and rotating about to give you a minimal idea of where the fuck you're even going and what's taking place in your surroundings. I assume it needs no explanation why this is plain sadistic when one stage already has leaps of faith and predator-esque mantis guys up the asshole, and the other requires you to destroy tiny cores to advance while slowly having your health drained by toxic rain. It's a nightmare! The other effect I really wasn't fond of was the soul bodies nonsense. In Inami Temple, I couldn't care less about them, but in the North Pole area, these douchebags pop up in your fucking evacuation spots and knock you off your safety ropes during the avalanche set piece. Avoiding these cheap shots is inconceivable and I got frustrated to no end with this. Now, before I get corrected on this one, by the comments, yes, I know the effect is triggered by Laser Institute and the boss there grants you the guard shell, which evaporates the soul bodies. This is not a good defense though. Firstly, messing around with your arsenal till you finally find something that circumvents this unjustified fuckery isn't engaging. Everything should be doable with your default inventory. Secondly, you could finish the secondary route or get a game over in Laser Institute, leave the stage, try the North Pole area, and thus get into this completely unfair situation. Oops, merely an oversight, no biggie pinheads. Thirdly, the entire nightmare system comes across as utterly random to newcomers. The game doesn't tell you that visiting certain stages trigger certain effects in others. You'll have to Google how this junk operates and find a descriptive list so that you can activate the least troublesome nightmare effect for the stage you want to tackle next. Very intuitive stuff indeed. It's on the same levels of obtuse as the RNG endings and part system fiascos in X5. Having said all of that, I I suspect the nightmare idea was partially inspired by X1's concept of particular stages being altered when others have been beaten. Chill Penguin stage freezing over Flame Mammoth stage and Storm Eagle stage messing up the lighting and electricity in Spark Mandrel stage. Who knows, perhaps there were good intentions behind this system in X6, putting a fresh spin on the levels on revisits and therefore decreasing monotony and increasing replayability. Thanks to its highly questionable execution However, it's hard to blame people, myself included, for believing it was implemented with an intent to bend us over. Even if it doesn't always hurt much, it can be real bad when it does, and the fact there aren't any favorable nightmare actions is what seals this shit deal the most. Speaking of shite, the fifth level of the freely choosable 8, Magma Area? What a son of a bitch! The only good part here is the obstacle course early on, with interfering enemies to get in your way, and and timed fire hazards to jump over and slip through. You know, being an actual stage, the rest of it sees you fighting a pathetically lazily designed mini boss that moves around in the utmost basic patterns, shooting green balls in fuck all directions from each of its four cores, all with almost no animation work done to it. Worse yet, you'll have a total of five encounters with this bloody bastard, with only the structure of each room forcing you to tackle it somewhat differently each time. Now, every one of these phases have their own crappy quirks, from being plain boring with a lot of waiting time, to sporting a slope that makes certain cores very awkward to properly hit. But the fourth one takes the cake! Half of the screen here is filled by rising, instant kill, purple fire while you attempt to fight the mini boss and hop from platform to platform. Nightmare viruses show up and can be jumped into when they have just barely come on screen, avoiding damage in general can be be virtually impossible really, and if the nightmare from the Amazon area is in effect, those goddamn bees can block your shots and fly into the fucking screen without warning. You think that's enough? More often than not, this ridiculous piece of donut shit
hit also positions itself too low to be able to attack the two bottom weak spots. After all, there is fatal fire rising underneath your ass. Your best bet then is to abuse invincibility frames to your advantage, because if you don't destroy the mini boss before the top of the room is reached, something not well in your own hands otherwise, you will get slaughtered without any pardon and can only possibly win if you have enough health remaining to outlast the upcoming war of attrition. The fact it took me close to two hours to beat this burning hellhole on my first playthrough as somebody who has so much Mega Man X experience under his belt speaks volumes. The most abominable stage in X6 or the series as a whole for that matter. The only way to retain your last snippets of sanity when suffering through this is by headbanging your fucking skull off because at least the music is supremely badass. Maybe I'm reading too deep into this but it's almost as if the song represents a pure reflection of the rage that's building up inside your body. The boss of Magma Area, Blaze Heatnix, at least cuts you some slack as he has duck suit by comparison. He summons fire from the top or bottom and does his best to annihilate you, but all to no avail as with full health and a wee bit of concentration, he can easily be brute forced. The schizophrenic difficulty is perplexingly jarring and this holds true for the majority of the eight main stage bosses when stacked against their respective levels. I've refrained from placing the spotlights on any of the main stage bosses till now because really most are pushovers just like blaze heatniks heck commander your mark check out how flirty those eyes are she's smoking hot man can even be killed by standing still and spamming the shoot button or moving up to her and slashing away with the z saber i kid you not of course all of them do have their own sort of patterns and strategies a ground scaravic rolls progressively bigger and bigger rocks across the screen that you can jump over via the four ropes while rainy Turd Lloyd sort of rolls around the room and requires you to destroy the two Master Emerald Shards on his back to damage him. Overall though, it's basic predictable jazz and when a fight actually has the potential to be engaging, being able to brute force them instead of needing to master them ruins that. I'm not even taking the weaknesses into consideration. The X Buster and Z Saber already tear most of these bosses a new one and as I've alluded to before, the Z Buster can straight up demolish a great deal of them. Don't even get me started on that, it's hysterical. Shield Sheldon is sometimes brought up to be a nuisance, so I guess he can be tough, but if you use the Z-Saber as either X or Zero and observe his tightly scripted movement, he quickly falls apart just as much as the others. The only true exception I can personally find is Infinity Maginion. Still, that doesn't mean his fight is suddenly well designed. This water flea can multiply himself seemingly infinitely hence his name, and every time he does, he leaves behind a bunch of liquid balls that take a decent amount of beating before they explode. If you aren't spot on with your actions, things can get very overwhelming very swiftly, and on top of that, Infinity Maginion likes to shoot out projectiles that diverge from a full circle around him. Good luck seeing this coming when everything else is already mad asking for your attention. This guy is hard alright, but in a lax sort of fashion that doesn't give me much satisfaction satisfaction after winning. Depending on your luck, some moderate brute forcing may even be the smarter option over trying to manage all this vomit on screen, further supporting my argument that even Infinity Maginion makes for, I'd say, at my most generous, a questionable encounter. Funnily enough, his stage itself, Weapon Center, falls flat for similar reasons. If I'm honest, there is hardly any speaking of level design here. It's practically a straight line to the boss door with a shower of of diarrhea periodically cut loose at once. It strikes me as a desperate attempt to mask the embarrassingly short length of the stage. The footage displayed should speak for itself on how brilliantly crafted it is, and if the nightmare effect from Magma Area is active, sets of burning meteors drop from the sky for good measure. You know you've got a keeper when the best strategy to beating a level is not paying attention to anything and just rushing through and taking the punches. Observation and taking one time is for pussies. You could also be forgiven for thinking certain spots aren't bottomless 
pits when they in reality are, thanks to the sloppy visual design of the foreground and background, and this stage highlights more of X6's lack of basic understanding of fair game design. Beating the mini bosses here locks your controls until the explosions are over. Yet the nightmare viruses that are still alive can fly towards you in the meantime. While you are invincible until you regain control, you will be taking one inevitable hit from this, and it can happen in other situations as well, such as when finding a Dr. Light capsule. A good title would try to ensure scenarios like these cannot result in the player taking unmerited damage. About Weapon Center though, what's most disappointing is that I see great potential in a thoughtfully designed level where you are assaulted by a huge ticked off reploid in the background with a selection of different attacks. Alas, it wasn't meant to be, but I do wholeheartedly adore the music. It's clearly inspired by the final countdown from the band Europe, but nonetheless one of the most epic songs in the X series. It's all the more of a bummer then that there is no epic stage stage to knock the ball out of the park. Thankfully, after the last two misstep stages, we have Recycle Lab, and this is another one of X6's finer works. The central gimmick from beginning to end is that there is a giant compressor lurking over your head that periodically rises and lowers, forcing you to take cover in small safe areas or duck when there is merely a hair of unoccupied space left. The learning and difficulty curve is strong here, and much like the North Pole area, this level seeks to build challenge around patience, timing, and precision. Until you get good at these three principles of the level, you're going to get punished and sent back. This is a much more thoughtful and fair approach to making a hard level than what many other of X6's stages resort to doing. A complaint here can be that the more methodic and slow-paced nature of the stage isn't fun, but that's no more than a matter of preference. Some people may find it tiring, while others may view it as a welcome change of Pace. What I do believe to subtract from the level's quality is some of the enemy placement. Nightmare viruses are present, which is fucking awkward in a cramped or even lethal predicament, and the worst are the instances where they are placed at the end of long stretches of no safe ground. You won't see them coming unless you are a psychic, and anybody unsuspecting is likely to get crushed because they lose a very precious time either trying to defeat the nightmare virus or by getting briefly hit stunned. Since this isn't a level centered around traps, and taking into account how navigation becomes pretty darn tricky of its own, this sort of surprise just feels unwarranted in conjunction with the sparse checkpoints throughout. Alongside Laser Institute, Recycle Lab is also a fantastic example of containing carefully planned out hogwash that really wakes the impression of the developers purposefully making X6 an exasperating chore to play. In both levels, Levels, you drop down into the rooms containing the crystals that transport you to the alternate routes. The problem is, there is no way to tell for sure whether you're on the main track or not, and once you do fall down to explore a bit further, you are not allowed to climb back out. Checkpoints are placed right there and then to ensure players cannot return to the main path and therefore have to restart the levels from scratch if they want to get back to said main path. Muppets. Well, in spite some of its negatives, Recycle Lab really is quite intense and unique, and what I'm about to say is what hurts me the most about X6. Despite all the ragging I've done, I sincerely find the ideas behind the stages to be pretty marvelous. Inami Temple's Acid Rain and Searching for Cores, Laser Institute sporting laser reflection puzzles, North Pole Area slippery platforming and various obstacle courses, Magma Area's focus on a mini boss rush, Weapon Center's giant Reploid harassing you, a Recycle Lab's compressor gimmick. I can accuse the game of a laundry list of sins it commits, but not of being undaring or uninspired. Nearly every stage attempts to shake up how you play or how you use the core mechanics in probably the most imaginative manner seen in the X series yet, and I think this really deserves to be recognized. As we've established, the ultimate execution then ranges from rage-inducing to more or less 
less competent, but it sets a contrast to what I was saying mere moments ago, that the developers were actually passionate about the project, and that they did want to create a delightful gaming experience. I am conflicted though, because X6 just keeps going and going, catapulting new asinine levels and issues around like a mad lunatic. One of these is the last stage of the main 8, Central Museum. Again, the designers tried to do something that wasn't done before in the series. There's a total of, I think, 8 rooms made for this level, but you can only possibly go through 4 each visit, as every time you enter a new room, it is randomly decided behind the curtains what you're ending up in. While this is nothing major, it is pretty neato that a second travel through this stage can have you running into different rooms and thinking to yourself, huh, I could swear. I have not been here before. The layouts are also pretty engrossing in terms of platforming and wall jumping and even the structure of the eight different rooms will shake themselves up every time. But sadly, this is the stage I was referring to earlier with nightmare viruses stuffed into the brim. I wouldn't necessarily call Central Museum hard because of this, but rather it doesn't make for an exciting place to be in in my opinion. Not only is it disappointing to have an utter lack of enemy variety, having to deal with multiple of these pricks so often can just be mighty tiring. Getting overwhelmed by them is money for old rope if you don't have a decent understanding of their behavior and tricks, and slowly picking them off one by one shouldn't be the only viable tactic. Additionally, while the different room stunts has its coolness factor, the heart tank, the headpiece of the blade armor, and the various rescuable reploids fall victim to it. Essentially, the game is pulling the strings on whether you'll be finding these items slash people. And as far as I could tell from my testing, dying and re-entering rooms will never place you in another version. Unless I was having incredibly pitiful luck, the result is that you possibly have to redo nearly the whole stage over and over till you finally get to the rooms that contain the stuff you're looking for. This is unforgivable. There is not a single excuse. They could have at least placed the heart tank and the headpiece for the blade armor along the central area where you cannot miss them. It's not like they aren't shoved in your miserable mush when you are transported to the desired room, right? If only I were kidding with that last sentence. The placement of the items in X6 leaves a lot to be desired on the whole. The only awesome idea in my box was needing to perform two consecutively precise dashes through these spikes with the blade armor to reach the body piece for the shadow armor in an army temple. It reminded me of X4 with having to use the lightning web to navigate through that clusterfuck of spikes in the Air Force. In any case, the rest of the shit in X6 is one of the following. A. In plain sight, like in X5. B. Stupidly cryptic, as demonstrated here. How you have to pass through the wall with absolutely zero visual cues or hints whatsoever. C. Shadow armor pieces that require either the blade armor or zero to reach for the same tired reason. Or D. Painfully, obviously, quote unquote, hidden. X6 stoops so low that it occasionally places two collectibles, a few footsteps and jumps apart from each other. Like really, check out how close this hard tank and armor piece are to one another. And in Weapon Center, the game flat out admits defeat and has two items chilling in the exact same location. Okay. All three items in Magma Area are also found after the first two mini-bosses, so have fun partially redoing that stage if you didn't get everything initially, and let me remind you, whenever something's tossed into the aforementioned alternate routes, you either have to commit suicide until the next game over, fight High Max, or whoop Dynamo's cheeks for the god knows how many a time. This also means being actively encouraged to avoid the EX tank at all costs, because having that only gives you more lives to put down the drain. Thoughtful minds at play right here. Oh, and the real spike in the crotch with this has yet to come. The start of the first gate stage contains a set piece with walls covered in- wait, wait, hold on. L let me just play this. Boy, 
that lead guitar in this theme, combined with those heavy orchestral hits and the stereo panning on the toms, is so sick. I wanted to let you hear that part and say my piece on it before we move on. So, as I was getting at, the start of the first gate stage contains a set piece with walls fully covered in instant kill spikes, which requires X to get either the shadow armor or the jumper part. Passing this section is otherwise impossible as him, and thus, this is the first Mega Man X installment that makes any collectibles mandatory to find just to be able to finish the adventure. The core idea behind the upgrades and parts was always that they were optional, rewards that made you stronger and more versatile through exploration. And I really cannot think of any reason to change this other than to be straight up cock faces or to pad out playtime. If you are not convinced this is a detrimental flaw, let's dive a little deeper. You see, X6 does the same thing as X5, where you need all the pieces of an armor before you can wear them at all. In as much as the blade armor is necessary to even get all the shadow armor pieces, for fuck's sake you have to get all four pieces for both armors! Factor in this one cryptic ass Zelda 2 style bullshit secret, Central Museum's bullshit of the randomly chosen rooms, the bullshit of leaving the alternate pass, and it's most easy to see why this whole situation is a humongous hunk of bullshit. Now I mentioned the jumper part, and the rescuable Reploid carrying this item can mercifully not be killed, but getting to him is another convoluted bitch in and of itself. He is located somewhere behind what looks like a breakable wall in the North Pole area here. You can try everything in your might to crush it, but instead it magically poofs away when the nightmare effect from Weapon Center happens to be active. This is already fucking random and illogical, but you wouldn't be aware the jumper part is found here to boot. With these two less than stellar options to enter gauge stage 1 as X, picking 0 instead seems like a no-brainer. This doesn't fly with me though, because what if the player didn't unlock 0 or simply prefers to play as X? I know I've ranted long enough about this one idiotic section now, but a thorough explanation why it should never have made it into the final release was obligatory. Oh well, you finally managed to get past this area, only to find out that the rest of the stage is a mess of its own. The first half is bombarded with lasers, of which the rules are communicated very poorly. You can pass through ones that are already fired, but you cannot touch their endpoints, and if a beam fired off while you were in its way, you do get damaged. I don't even know for sure if I'm honest, but I think it's safe to say that's irrelevant, as the lasers don't seem to serve much of a purpose besides heavily distracting players from what they should actually be focusing on. The hazard and enemy placement and number of enemies is also remarkably sluggish, so combined with the overload of confusing lasers, there is just too much visual information spewed at you all at once and a little too much surprise motherfucker going on. What's most odd though is that the second half of the level is super bare bones by comparison. The bulk of it has you traveling the level vertically to reach the boss room with not much to hinder you and the auto scrolling is kinda slow to boot. It's hardly any exciting despite the rising fire and ignoring that, it's just very jarring how the difficulty flip flops here. By the end we face the nightmare mother and fuck this stupid boss! You're basically fighting two eyeballs in their own separate package of cells or something, both of which move from one corner of the room to another and pretty darn fast at that. The problem is that there is no visual cue or hint about them moving clockwise or counterclockwise, so your reflexes have to be 100% on point throughout to consistently avoid them and halfway through they can decide to randomly change direction just to throw you off. Once these monstrosities come to a stop, the eyes come out for you to attack them, but they let out a variety of ambushes too. While some of these assaults are perfectly manageable, others like the electric strikes to the ground or the barrage of burning fireballs across the screen feel random with no proper strategy to dodging them. May God have mercy on your soul that you don't get hit or otherwise as little as possible. Rinse and repeat these two cycles of the fight until you win or die and once the health bar of these two reaches a certain point, their movement speed across the room drastically increases. Come on, was that really necessary? Seriously, even with the hyper dash and jumper parts, I struggled to nail the movement. I was expected to perform so flawlessly, so I can only imagine without them equipped. Avoiding damage in this encounter is nearly inconceivable as far as I could tell, and whether you can survive long enough to come out victorious seems primarily a matter of luck. Yes, 
yes, this abomination has a weakness, and yes, it will help a lot, but the fact that I was still taking a ton of damage that wasn't by my mistake, after 90 minutes of practicing this boss without the weakness, is strongly indicated. I mastered Sigma's second phase in Mega Man X4 after about 15 to 20 minutes, for comparison's sake. Alright, proceeding on to Gauge Stage 2, there are two main rooms worth addressing. In the first of these, I really like how the last two totem poles have to be dealt with. That is, while standing on very narrow moving platforms, one of which goes from right to left and back, and the other that goes from down to up and back. Experimenting with X and Zero's different weapons and techniques to come up with your own solutions to the complex setups is much incentivized, though not strictly necessary if you don't want to. It's a shame there is still too much crap going on, with annoying enemies rolling around the room that abruptly screech to a halt to fire bullets, and of course nightmare viruses can't let go of these cunts, can we? But there are those glimmers of clever, engaging level design present here that could have elevated X6 above the rest of the series if it were pulled off consistently well in the entire game. The following room can screw right off though, because some very tricky movement has to be done through a cramped area area filled with spikes. A one tiny slip up or imprecision and you are sent back to the first of these two rooms, forced to redo the totem poles area all over again to get another chance. This can get infuriating very easily because of the questionable checkpointing. If there were a checkpoint in this room, I wouldn't have an issue with the spike section, and if the spike section wasn't there, I wouldn't have an issue with the current checkpointing. Thankfully, the shadow armor makes this spike section a non-issue, so there's at least that if you picked it, but you know, that's not something you'd want to sell your level on. Shortly after the spike section, we run into High Max. Regardless of whether you've beaten him before or not, nice job giving no explanation on that game, and this incarnation of him, I am ambivalent on. Nothing he does is something I'd label as cheap, but figuring out how to even attack the douchebag in the first place can again feel sort of out there, especially if you're ex and are not wearing the shadow armor. In that case, you have to dispatch him of his shield, hit him with a regular buster charge shot, and then with any secondary weapon you may have. This feels needlessly cryptic to me. I can imagine it's easy for a player to get frustrated because they cannot figure out how to even visibly damage this tank. Maybe this is subjective, but I don't believe this is where Mega Man boss battles should get their challenge from. Even when you figure out how to even go about it, you won't be dealing much damage every round, so prepare for this encounter to drag pretty badly in this situation. It really depends on the selected character and armor how you perceive high max, but I will say with zero or the shadow armor, I think it's the least offensive out of the three gauge stage bosses. With a different configuration, it's one of the most drowned out and boring battles I found myself putting up with. After kicking that guy's scrap metal, however, you learn gauge stage 2 isn't over yet. Strange, but I do have to admit it's a novel idea how Zero and X go through a different part of the level from here until they reach Gate himself. Splitting the heroes up isn't something the level designers had to do, yet they chose to do so regardless, and I appreciate that. Zero goes through a callback to Recycle Lab, and it's a really good section. The enemies are all placed correctly for once, I like the instances of having to cling onto walls above pits, and seeing foes get crushed by the compressor is so darn gratifying. The game is finally showing some mercy. On the other hand, we have Exa section, where you deal with a lot of those Mumbando bastards and the gimmick from Minami Temple of searching for little cores while acid rain is pouring down. I don't have much noteworthy to say about this portion, except for the fucking glaring bullshit that X in his shadow armor cannot complete the stage without specific parts. Christ, this garbage again? What a way to screw players wearing the shadow armor in the ass. Now these players have to leave the goddamn level, go through the entire fucking level again, and fight Hi-Max again. How incredibly convenient now that it's all part of the same long level, don't you think? Fuck me. This game sucks, dude. What's the reason for this? 
God damn. And the worst part is, the gate boss at the end of this stage makes for a half-baked and uninteresting battle too. You deal damage by destroying these energy balls sent your way, which cause them to diverge in six different directions in the hope one of them makes contact with gate himself. The reasons I don't like this fight are as follows. A, there is a substantial amount of doing very little while you're waiting for the guy to hover over to your platform, making stuff slow-paced and especially yawn-inducing if you die often. B, trying to bust these energy balls on such small platforms without getting yourself hurt in the process is just really awkward, if not impossible in many cases. The arrangements of these disjointed platforms above one gigantic bottomless pit doesn't lend itself well to hitting said energy balls enough times from a different location. C, you're only given so much time before the energy balls disappear and thus won't help you diddly donkey. And D, each of the different colors have a unique, harmful effect on you, from slowing down your movements and tinkering with your controls, to spawning those cursed nightmare viruses, to slowly pulling you towards the ball no matter where you are, which causes this mess where you're clinging onto a wall that is weird to revert or get under control without falling to your death. I wouldn't call this a terrible encounter and I'll give it a compliment for at least a trying something unconventional, for thinking outside the box. But it won't get your adrenaline pumping and it doesn't feel like enough thought was put into it. Lackluster for Gate being the main villain of X6. Ah, who am I kidding? He's fucking not. After the fight, a cutscene plays where Gate summons Sigma from out of nowhere. We know by now that Sigma is an ungrateful tool, so he proceeds to blast the ever-living shit out of Gate, and the voice acting makes it sound excruciatingly painful. I fucking love this part. I cannot get enough of it. Silly story twists and hilarious voice acting aside, after this you're on your way to reach Sigma. Self-explanatory, there is a boss rush impeding your progress and it highlights one last time how awfully balanced the main 8 Mavericks are in terms of difficulty. The default equipment or weakness weapons doesn't matter. It also does very little to make the fights any different from before. The health bars barely differ in size, unlike in X5 where that was night and day, and getting a game over won't reset at the Mavericks you've already beaten, like an X2 to X4. Following the boss rush is one last, unremarkable stretch filled with Mumbandos and some other arse hats, and then there's the showdown with Sigma himself, which ironically really isn't anything to be scared of. In fact, it's probably one of the easiest in the X series. The first phase is a joke, and I am convinced that, that was intentional. Sigma basically slogs along in his half-broken body and can unleash an array of different projectiles and attacks at the player. If you're lucky, you can literally spam the shoot button and hardly take any damage, and fortunately when he does assault you, his stuff is well telegraphed with enough time to get out of the way. It's a fair phase at the minimum, but underwhelming nonetheless. The second phase is definitely more challenging and involved, as the tired maverick spits out a bunch of slime heads that crowd the screen, but not to a stupid over-the-top level like Infinity Maginion. From my experience, it's a manageable fight if you can utilize the unoccupied space well, and enemies have a chance of dropping health and weapon energy pickups. This even refills your tanks, always, regardless of whether your health bar or weapon energy gauge are full or not. That's pretty convenient and makes regenerating shit for your tanks less of a hassle than in X4 and X5 if you ask me. There are still some notable balancing issues as Zero and Shadow Armor X can kill Sigma pretty effortlessly after he's opened his mouth a handful of times, whereas with X in the other armors, it takes more proper hits and concentration. There are definitely better and harder Sigmas in the series, but at least I think this one is better designed than X3s, which isn't saying much. Still, the final boss is probably one of the finest bosses in this X6 mess. After beating it and some very vicious and long-lasting explosions, there are three possible endings that play out. Though I will not detail any 
of them because I scrapped the story portion from this review, I have to give credit where credit is due and say at least it's not regulated via RNG like in X5. In X6, there is one for X with Zero Rescued, one for X without Zero Rescued, and one for Zero himself beating Sigma. A big improvement for those curious to see all the endings. Whichever you get though, the credits are going to roll afterwards with some upbeat J-pop music, and that concludes the adventure that is Mega Man X6. What a wild ride. Evidently, I think there is a whole ton wrong with the game, reflecting on everything I've said, and there are a few more points I really want to drive home before I close the curtains on it. Primarily, the arguments made by people in its defense. Despite X6's reputation and all the crap it's received, there are folks who legit like it and call it a good title. Stated reasons are that it was made for the hardcore and expert players, those looking for a ball-busting crazy challenge challenge, or that once you get used to all the bullshit and know how to avoid or circumvent it, the game really isn't all that bad. Some would even go as far as to say that people who hate X6 only do so because they simply suck at it. It should go without saying that everybody's entitled to their opinion, but I'll try my best to explain why I don't agree with any of this. First of all, I haven't stumbled upon a single source that should lead me to believe that X6 was indeed meant to be extremely difficult. If you can link me to something proving that this is true, I'd love to see it. Secondly, even if this is the case, the difficulty balancing is broken as fuck. Some stages are laughably short and a piece of cake like Laser Institute, while others are soul-crushingly brutal such as Magma Area. Considering that the eight main stages are freely selectable from the start, there is no excuse for them to vary so wildly in how hard they are. Magma Magma Area and Central Museum, for instance, are far too relentless to be tackled so early on. And this is also why I didn't take secondary weapons and techniques into consideration for the main 8 stages. Yeah, Magma Area is 100 times easier and quicker with the right equipment, as both X and Zero with their own variants of screen covering ambushes, and yeah, Nightmare Viruses aren't threatening suckers as much with some of X's special weapons or Zero's powerful for Z Saber, but each of these levels should be feasible to get through with that what is offered to the player right after the intro stage. If the designers weren't fond of that, they should have used the Mega Man 7 setup of two sets of four stages to scale the difficulty more. Many bosses, sure as hell, also don't affirm to this goal of making the game hard. Most of them are strikingly pathetic compared to their respective stages. Thirdly, there are difficulty selections. They should should have been utilized better. Why wasn't normal mode the extreme mode instead? The existing extreme mode is batshit insane. Enemies and nightmare viruses all over the fucking place. So realistically, how many people are gonna bother with that? I am aware there is an easy mode, but normal mode is the default and what you'd expect to be the intended experience. Generally, when a game has an easy mode, many seasoned gamers tend to avoid it because easy has kind of this dishonorable sound to it. For that singular reason, this entire review has been written with a normal mode in mind. That said, I did finish easy mode as both X and Zero and it is notably less obnoxious. I would certainly recommend newcomers to X6 to start with easy mode before normal or god forbid extreme, but unfortunately not even easy mode fixes most of X6's fundamental design flaws. This leads us to the final nail in the coffin. X6's hardships come from the wrong places, its so-called fake difficulty. All the arbitrary, unpredictable, tedious, time-consuming bollocks I've talked about was not the right way to go about making X6 a tough cookie. It's all nasty tricks and a lack of playtesting that created an unbalanced, unfair and unfinished product, and easy mode doesn't alleviate a lot of this. It doesn't change the overall shitty boss design, the blatant 
shortness of some of the levels, the camera issues, the nightmare system and its obtuseness, the issues involved with the alternate secondary routes, the abundance of reploids of which not nearly all give you anything, the randomization in Central Museum that can cause you to miss upgrades and items, the mandatory need for collectibles to pass the gate stages as X, and whatever other faulty design I've brought attention to. X6 isn't fun and satisfying challenging. This is hard to put into words, but many things I've overcome in the game gave me a sigh of relief, not a joyful celebration of finally pulling off a great feat. In the end, you may wonder, are there no positive aspects to X6 then? There absolutely are, and I wholeheartedly addressed them and admitted to them. There are some improvements made over X5, being able to put a pacifier in Alias mouth to stop her crying, streamlining the part system and ditching the Enigma and Shuttle Jazz, and I can genuinely see the potential for this to be the most varied and deepest Mega Man X installment out there, as the level design has its moments every now and then of being surprisingly engrossing. The soundtrack is also exquisite. If you ask me, it's barely below X once or even on par with some beautiful variety in instrumentation and composition. I mean, I think the background music for Central Museum is the only one exception to the rule. The rule being that every song is great in some fashion or another. The score is probably the best of X6's facets, terrifyingly similar to Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, but there is only so much questionable and outright terrible design you can throw in the face of an unsuspecting newcomer before they just give up, burn the disc, or literally break a controller like my friend J of J's reviews and forget about what was actually done right. Whether you agree or disagree with me, I am firm in my belief that... <laughs> Mega Man X6 is a bad game. It would be delusional of me to say it is the worst game of all time. There is undoubtedly far worse tribe out there, but it is probably the worst Mega Man game I've personally played so far. I'm not going to repeat myself with any points in this conclusion. Everything I wanted to say has been discussed in depth, but I do wonder what on earth happened here. I know X5 was supposed to be the last X release and that X6 was rushed out the door to fill Capcom's pockets, but scarily often, the game rides a very vague line where I cannot tell if the problems were caused by development struggles and a lack of playtesting, or intentionally created to make an artificially hard and frustrating adventure. It might be a combination of both of these aspects. Some of the painfully unfinished stages and the horribly balanced difficulty clearly hint at time constraints, but simultaneously, I have a hunch that the developers simply weren't remarkably good at what they were doing. X5 already showed signs of going downhill, and I wasn't too shocked to discover that the same exact director and core designers were in charge of X6. Now of course, I have absolutely no ill will towards them, neither to the folks and fans out there who do actually enjoy and like X6. Heck. I even find it quite entertaining to play at its strongest moments now that I know how to avoid all the bullshit. It's perfectly functional and I'm glad I can say that because it signifies that, at least if you're playing with a guide of some sort, you can have a good, fun and relatively frustration free time. Still, I haven't lost perspective of the game's woeful overall quality and my initial two playthroughs won't slip my mind anytime soon. Mega Man X6 is one of those popular popular textbook examples of how not to design a difficult video game or a video game period. But whether that is something to be proud of, 